Before this week, I knew very little about Africa's history. It's a continent of many nations, nations whose boundaries and governments are near constantly in some state of transition. It's a beautiful continent, rich in wildlife, natural resources, and culture, but suffering under perpetual war, famine, and chaos. Currently, the United Nations recognizes 54 nations in Africa. So does the African Union. However, they don't recognize the same 54 nations. For example, Morocco is part of the United Nations, but not a member of the African Union. The recently created region of Western Sahara is recognized by the African Union, but not by the United Nations. And a lot of these 54 nations are real new. Nambia just left South Africa in 1990. Uh, Eritrea left Ethiopia in 1993. South Sudan left Sudan not even a decade ago in 2011. And there could soon be several other countries voicing their independence very, very soon. Uh, due to numerous civil wars currently raging in Africa. There are currently 15 African countries experiencing either war or post-war tension. Why is there so much turmoil? Well, the turmoil isn't new. It's been going on for a while in Africa, and a lot of it has to do with some good old-fashioned European imperialism. We know something about that here in America. It's how our nation was formed. So how was Africa carved up into the nations we know of today? Well, it all started in the late 1800s when Europe decided to stop taking African slaves and instead just take the whole fucking continent. And Africans today are still dealing with the repercussions of that decision. So let's learn more about the continent you, in all likelihood, know less about than other continents. Africa. Africa's history is fascinating, and we explore much of it today on Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, time suckers and soon-to-be space lizards. Hail Nimrod. Praise Bojangles. Keep an eye on Lucifina. Stay away from Chikatilo. And enjoy the smooth, soft rock sounds of Triple M and James Ingram. I'm Dan Cummins, a.k.a. the Master of Suckage, a.k.a. Suctimus Prime, a.k.a. the Great Honorable Lord Master of Suck, Dr. Reverend Professor King Cummins, Magnificent, Magnificent Esquire the First. That was a mouthful. I uh, love the stuff you suckers cook up uh, each week when you send in your messages. And this is Time Suck. Recording from the Suck Lair with producer and patriot, Reverend Dr. Josh Krell. Huge thanks to those of you who are signing up for the secret suck and becoming space lizards. You breathe life into the suck. You make all this possible. The first episode of the secret suck drops on Thursday, February 8th. Why next week and not this week? Well, to give you guys time to send in voice messages into the app to be incorporated into the show. The secret suck will then drop Thursdays at noon Pacific time. To have a chance at having a message heard, be sure to get in your messages by the Monday uh, at noon of that week. With my tour schedule, I'll probably be recording The Secret Suck on Tuesdays for that Thursday release. Give us time to edit it all together and get it ready. I uh, hope you enjoy your new stand-up album that comes with membership. By the way, feel the heat. Hope you're uh, already enjoying the other new stand-up album, Maybe I'm the Problem, now on Pandora. Link in the episode description for both the Patreon site to become a space lizard uh, and get that album, Feel the Heat, and uh, the new podcast, and also the free Pandora album. Uh, more details after today's tale. A couple quick tour announcements, and then we're off. Then we're off and running. Thanks to you Philly suckers. Appreciate the awesome support. Congrats to all those birds as well. Uh, thanks to you Baltimore suckers as well. Making the goobies pop. Uh, Chicago, don't fuck up this weekend. Don't ruin it for everybody. January 31st through Feb 3rd, come to Zany's. It's an amazing comedy club. It's going to be a good time. New York City, Gotham Comedy Club, one night only, February 11th, Detroit. February 16th at the Magic Bag in Ferndale with the boys from Small Town Murder. Stand-up show is sold out. Ticks selling fast for the swap, swap cast, for the live swap cast. Minneapolis, March 2nd and 3rd podcast, sold out. Ticks selling fast for the stand-up shows. More tour dates at dancummins.tv. More announcements at the end of the show, including Time Sucker updates and a sneak preview of my second new 2018 stand-up album, Feel the Heat, that you can get for five bucks when you try out becoming a space lizard. And that's the only way you get it. And time now for the colonial devastation of Africa. All right, let's get into a little brief history of pre-colonial Africa. Africa, by all accounts, is probably where we all come from. So let's talk about the origins of culture on this continent before we dive into what happened to Africa starting in the 1800s. Let's get a feel for the continent's pre-colonial history first. Uh, the oldest evidence for human life on planet Earth has consistently come from Africa. 
Uh, maybe someday someone will have found, you know, five million year old tomb or something in Arkansas or Saskatchewan or, or Costa Rica or the lost city of Atlantis. You know, it will somehow be real against all logical evidence to the contrary. But until new contrary info comes in, if in fact it ever does, we're all African. So suck on that, white supremacist. You're African. Deal with it. In this sense, uh, I'm African American, as are all Americans, if you trace your ancestors back far enough. Finally. I get to be black in some small, small way that has likely involved zero historical exploitation. Uh, the eighth uh, grader in me that has desperately wanted to be either Michael Jordan or Carl Malone could not be happier. I still kind of want to be Carl Malone sometimes, you know, or at least look like him, have his physical strength. Dude was so strong. He's still so strong. You see pictures of him now? Dude, <laughs> dude's a beast, right? Oh, God, he was a fucking great power forward. Through the most vicious elbow in NBA history, no one pick and rolled like the fucking mailman. Greatest NBA player never to win a championship. All respect uh, to Charles Barkley on that as well. I know he's also fantastic, but he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not the mailman to me. Okay, anyway, sorry. It's, uh, I know a lot of you could give two shits about sports. The earliest evidence uh, of the existence of homo sapiens, homo, homo sapiens, that's us by the way, uh, comes from some bones discovered last year in a cave 62 miles west of Marrakesh, Morocco, near the very northwest tip of Africa. The bones, bones, uh, bones of a small clan of cave dwellers are estimated to, uh, to be about 280 to 350,000 years old. In eastern Africa, even older bones have been found that are alleged to belong to previous versions of the Homo genus. A jawbone fossil with five teeth still intact was unearthed in the Ethiopian desert in 2015, estimated to be 2.8 million years old. No other bones were found, so the rest of the skeleton either completely decomposed or, much weirder and very improbable, three million years ago, human beings didn't have bodies. We didn't even have the tops of our heads yet. That all came later, I guess. Three million years ago, we were just, uh, you know, part of a jaw and a few teeth, which had to have been a hard way to live. Uh, tough to get around, even tougher to breed, if you think about those logistics. You know? Guessing the rest of the skeleton uh, just dissolved as opposed uh, to the jaw possibility. Hard to accomplish much in life and keep the species going when you're just part of a jaw. Uh, well, this jawbone was uh, found in 2013 in uh, northeastern Ethiopia, a far region about 40 miles from where the remains of Lucy, one of the most famous fossils of a human ancestor, were discovered in 1974. Uh, Lucy species, uh, fucking crazy-ass word, Australopithecus, Australopithecus. Uh, Afren Afrenis, Afrensis, Jesus Christ, immediately preceded the Homo genus. Those are words you just, you know, you don't throw out a lot in just casual conversation. Hey, uh, what do you guys want to talk about? Do you want to talk about the Super Bowl or do you want to talk about Australia Pithecus Afer Afrensis? Uh, probably football. Uh, so, you know, uh, things go way back in Africa. OG humans. And Africa, before it got all mishmashed by Europeans, had a lot of impressive ancient uh, advanced cultures, like the Egyptians, who founded, amongst other things, the Illuminati. Uh, they were the ones who made enough sacrifices to the devil, to Beelzebub, to get that big floating eye to appear over the pyramids. The eye of Sauron. And the Dark Lord ruled them and gave rise to the orcs who would try to kill the hobbits. Wait. Uh, I got lost there. Okay, no, no, yeah, the eye part was bullshit. Uh, somehow I drifted uh, for a bit into Lord of the Rings territory. Let's talk about ancient Egyptians. For some reason, when you search for ancient African civilizations, the Egyptians often don't uh, come up, which I think is, you know, messed up. Egypt is in Africa, for sure. I have checked several maps. I've double-checked them. So logic would dictate that ancient Egyptians uh, were Africans, because they were. Uh, but because they spread a tiny bit into Middle East, into the Middle East, uh, interacted a great deal with Middle Eastern civilizations, they get lumped in with the Middle Eastern, uh, you know, with Middle Eastern history sometimes. But now, nah, motherfucker, African. And no discussion of Africa's pre-colonial civilization would be complete without mentioning them. And the Egyptian culture goes way back. They had a standing army 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. They had a monarchy already. All right, it was the reign of, of, of King uh, Amen, Amen, <laughs> God, I these words, uh, Amenemhet, 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 whatever, the first, A-M-E-N-E-M-H-A hat, uh, fucking A hat, oh, King A hat, uh, ancient Egypt, I, I write these pronunciation things, but you know what, when you fucking never use a word, I can put the pronunciation there as much as I want, but then when my, my, my eyes hit the word, it's like, what? The king of what? Huh? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not an Egyptian scholar. 
So I don't have those words just fucking dialed in. Anyway, ancient Egypt unified as a culture sometime around uh, 3100 BCE, over 5,000 years ago. It was the preeminent civilization in the Mediterranean before the Romans rose to the height of their power. Before 3100 BCE, two cultures lived in the Nile River Delta. One in the north, one in the south. Legend holds that the southern king, the first scorpion king, the Rock, Dwayne the Rock Johnson, attempted to conquer the north in 3200 BCE, and he fucking WWE'd their asses. No, that was a movie. Uh, but but there was a guy named Scorpion King. This is going on thousands of years before the Aztecs and the Incans or Incas uh, civilization. It's going on almost three thousand years before the beginning of Rome, centuries before the ancient Greeks. The only civilization we know of that's older is the is in the cradle of civilization, nearby present day Syria, Turkey, and Iran, the ancient Mesopotamians. And the Egyptians contributed so much to the evolution of humankind right there in Africa. Uh, writing. Right? The Egyptians, along with the Mesopotamians, uh, were one of the first two cultures to develop a written language, uh, paper, early paper. Uh, the Egyptians developed what was essentially the world's first paper, um, uh, pap- uh, uh, papyrus. Papyrus. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't look up the pronunciation of that one. You know what? I'm not going to stop. It's P-A-P-Y-R-U-S. You decide. Is it papyrus? Is it papyrus? Is it fucking nonsense? Is it fuck these words? They developed the world's first paper. Fuck these word sheets. Uh, the the papyrus plant is I hate this word right now. Is a reed that grows in marshy areas. This is the trick when you're. This is the trouble when you're doing uh, episodes that deal with like multiple civilizations. You know, you get into like a Germany episode. You just like, all right, I'm gonna lock lock and load some bullshit German pronunciation in my head and be good for today. But then these ones where you're bouncing around, you know, my, my old brain, my old noggin, my old noggin melon. It just can't ping pong too too good between these uh, uh, all these cultures. But anyway, uh, you know they grew this shit uh, in plantations to make writing material. The inside of the tri- triangular stock was cut or peeled into long strips. These strips were then laid out in two layers, one horizontal, one vertical, and they pressed and dried to form a sheet. How cool is that? They had old school paper factories while the rest of the world was either banging some pictures into rocks drawn on caves, maybe on cave walls, you know, I don't know, uh, or, or running around naked hoping to spear some critter or, or bang it on the head with a rock. God, that would be a rough way to hunt, by the way, just, you know, with a rock. I'm guessing if there was an ancient tribe that chose to hunt that way, they, they probably died out pretty quick. Chief, me want to try hunt new way. M- me make knife. Me make sharp rock knife. Tie to stick. Throw at critter. No, that is not the way of dodo people. Go grab big rock. Chase critter. Bang on head, bring back to eat. This is how we have survived for weeks. C- could we at least make one sharp rock to cut up meat with? Maybe try and start a fire to cook it. No, that is not Dodo way. We kill with rock, then tear rock off with fingers. Eat what can. Get violently ill. Shit selves for hours. Anyway, I feel like that. Uh, I feel like that tribe was somewhere near the Ukraine, based on uh, that weird accent. The Egyptians were not Dodos. Uh, they invented uh, ink. The Egyptians mixed vegetable gum, soot, beeswax to make black ink. They replaced soot with other materials uh, to make various colors. Uh, they revolutionized agriculture with oxtron, you know, the oxtron plow. What a, what a good day for laborers and farmers that was, man. So many backs saved when they realized a giant, super strong, four-legged, walking, nearly indestructible bulldozer was much better at tilling some acres than an injury-prone biped. And they invented all kinds of stuff. The obelisk-based uh, sundials to tell time, the concept of private police forces, surgical instruments, suturing wounds, swabs, bandages, adhesive plaster, surgical stitches, cauterization, etc. They even invented an early form of toothpaste. And, of course, you know, the whole pyramid thing. Got to do some Egyptian sucks down the road to, to further dig into all this and <laughs> deal with the pronunciation issues I'm sure you guys are going to raise in your emails this week. Uh, all of that happened in Africa thousands of years ago, and the Egyptians weren't the only major African civilization. There was various other kingdoms, such as the Kingdom of Kush. Right? There was uh, the Kingdom of Kush, and they stood as a regional power in Africa for over a thousand years, and they invented weed, motherfucker. Sweet, euphoric Kush weed. They first coined the term high as fuck, and they smoked so much weed, especially on 420. No, they did not. Uh, the Kingdom of Kush was an ancient Nubian empire that reached its peak in the second millennium BCE when it ruled over a vast swath of territory along the Nile River in what is now Sudan. It was an important economic power that operated a lucrative market in ivory, incense, iron, especially gold. The kingdom was both a, a trading partner and a military rival of Egypt. It even ruled Egypt as the 25th dynasty, and it adopted many of its neighbors' customs. The Kushites worshipped some of the Egyptian gods, mummified their dead, built their own types of pyramids. The area surrounding the ancient Kushite capital of Miro is now home to the ruins of over 2 
hundred pyramids more than in all of Egypt. It was Carthage, the ancient kingdom of Carthage, best known as Rome's rival in the Punic Wars. Carthage was a North African commercial hub that flourished for over 500 years. The city-state began its life in 8th or 9th century BCE as a Phoenician settlement in what is now Tunisia, Tunisia, uh, but it later grew into a sprawling seafaring empire that dominated trade in textiles, gold, silver, and copper. At its peak, its capital city boasted nearly half a million inhabitants and included a protected harbor outfitted with docking bays for 220 ships. Carthage's influence eventually extended from North Africa to Spain and parts of the Mediterranean, but its thirst for expansion uh, led to increased friction with the burgeoning Roman Republic and beginning of 264 BCE. The ancient superpowers clashed in the three bloody Punic Wars, the last of which ended in 146 BCE with the near total destruction of Carthage. Today, almost all that remains of the once mighty empire is a series of ruins in the city of Tunis. And then there's the Kingdom of Oxum. There was the Kingdom of Oxum. During the uh, same period that the Roman Empire rose and fell, the influential Kingdom of Oxum held sway over parts of what is now uh, Eritrea and northern Ethiopia. Surprisingly, little is known about Oxum's origins. But by the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD, uh, or I guess CE, uh, it was a trading juggernaut whose gold and ivory made it a vital link between the ancient Europe and Far East. The kingdom had a written language, one of the first to emerge in Africa, and it developed a distinct architectural style that involved the building of massive stone obelisks, some of which stood over uh, 100 feet tall. In the 4th century, Oxum became one of the first empires in the world to adopt Christianity, which led to a political and military alliance with the Byzantines. That, by the way, is the correct American pronunciation for that word. So fucking take it easy, Brits. You cool your imperial pronunciation jets. I know I've been criticized in the past for that one, so I did I did do extra research. Yeah, it can be Byzant Byz Byzantine, I think is another way to say it, but I don't fucking I'll play that game. All right, the empire later went into a decline sometime around the seventh or eighth century, but its religious legacy still exists today in the form of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And then we got the Mali Empire, the people who created ecstasy and raves and Burning Man. No, they didn't. The founding of the Mali Empire dates to the 1200s when a ruler named uh, Sun, Sun, Sundieta, Sundieta Kaita, sometimes called the Lion King, and he led a revolt against the Soso King and, and united his subject into a new state. Under Kaita and his successors, the empire tightened its grip over a large portion of West Africa and grew rich on trade. Its important cities were Guinea and Timbuktu, both of which were renowned for their elaborate adobe mosques and Islamic schools. And one such institution, Timbuktu's Sankor University, included a library with an estimated 700,000 manuscripts. 700,000 manuscripts, man. Way back when. That is not, third, uh, you know, like, I think it was the biggest library uh, of its kind in the world at that point in history. 300,000 of those were the world's first pornography magazines. They had everything. Man on woman. Woman on woman. Man on man. Man on man on woman. Woman on man on woman on tiger. Tiger on woman on Bojangles. Yes. Bojangles got into a little fucking porn back in Timbuktu, okay? Don't judge. It was easy money. And uh, the Mali Empire was hungry for some one-eyed, three-legged pit bull action. A hundred thousand of Timbuktu's manuscripts are rumored to have been naked photos of Bojangles in some sort of compromising and hardcore uh, scenario. Uh, sadly, almost none of those are still around today. In 2013, Islamic terrorists destroyed many of the manuscripts, uh, especially the ones involving animal porn, because they're fucking dicks. They're morons. No, the porn stuff was, to be clear, uh, nonsense. But the rest of that history, they did have 700,000 manuscripts. That's bananas to me. The Mali Empire eventually disintegrated in the 16th century. Uh, but at its peak, it was one of the jewels of the African continent and was known all over the world for its wealth and luxury. One legendary tale about the kingdom's riches concerns the ruler Mansa Musa, who made a stopover in Egypt during a 14th century pilgrimage to Mecca. According to contemporary sources, Musa dished out so much gold during the visit, he caused the value of gold itself to plummet in Egypt, uh, Egyptian markets for several years. Oh, man, that's, uh, that's some serious, serious cash. Uh, and then you got the Songhai Empire. When you're talking about sheer size, few states in African history can compare to the Songhai Empire. Formed in the 15th century from some of the former regions of the Mali Empire, this West African kingdom was larger than all of Western Europe and compromised parts of a dozen modern-day nations. 
So the empire enjoyed a period of prosperity thanks to vigorous trade policy, sophisticated bureaucratic system that separated its vast holdings into different provinces, each ruled by their own governor. Uh, it, re- it reached its zenith in the early 16th century under the rule of devout King Muhammad Askia, uh, who conquered new lands, forged an alliance with Egypt's um, uh, Muslim caliph, and established hundreds of Islamic schools in Timbuktu. While the Songhai Empire was once among the most powerful states in the world, it later crumbled in the late 1500s after a period of civil war and internal strife left it open to an invasion by the Sultan of Morocco. And then there's uh, there's other kingdoms that have been lost to history. One of the most impressive monuments in sub-Saharan Africa is the Great Zimbabwe, an imposing collection of stacked boulders, stone towers, and defensive walls assembled from cut granite blocks. I suggest Googling it. Very, very cool ancient fortress. Kind of fortress you dream about either defending or sieging as a young boy. Uh, man, I used to want a fortress. Who am, I, who am I kidding? I would still love a fortress. Protect this fortress, O great Nimrod, for my insolent neighbors who want to look into my yard as I throw a squeaky ball for fair Penny Pooperton. I do not care for their judgmental stares. I do not care for their certain judgment upon me for sometimes squeak, speaking in a baby voice to a sweet fair Penny Pooperton. Yes, the Rock Citadel has long been the subject of myths and legends. It was once thought to be uh, the residence of the biblical Queen of Sheba. But historians now know it as the capital city of an indigenous empire that thrived in the region between the 13th and 15th centuries. This kingdom ruled over a large chunk of modern-day Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. Fucking nailed those three. It was particularly rich in cattle and precious metals and stood aside a trade route that connected the region's gold fields with ports on the Indian Ocean coast. Though little is known about its history, the remains of artifacts such as Chinese pottery— uh, Arabian glass, European textiles indicate that it was once a well-connected mercantile center. The fortress city at the Great Zimbabwe was mysteriously abandoned sometime in the 15th century after the kingdom went into decline. But its heyday, or during its heyday, it was, it was home to an estimated 20,000 people. And then there are the punts. Uh, I got some punts running around. Be careful how you say that one. A uh, few African civilizations are as mysterious as those punts. Uh, historical accounts of the kingdom date to around 2500 BCE when it appears in Egyptian records as land of the gods, rich in ebony, gold, myrrh, exotic animals such as apes, lezard, uh, <laughs> le- lezards, uh, leopards. Uh, the, the Egyptians are known to have sent uh, huge caravans and flotillas on trade missions to punt, most notably during the 15th century BCE reign of Queen uh, Hatshepsut. Yes, they never identified where it was located. Uh, there's Kingdom of the Congo. Uh, it was more recently, the Kingdom of Congo. The Kingdom of the Congo uh, flourished along the Congo River in west central, uh, in the west central coast of Africa from about the 14th century and lasted right up until the 20th century when it was integrated into the Portuguese colony of Angola. The kingdom covered a large part of what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, but the king lived in what is now Angola. And King Nimi uh, from near uh, present-day Boma conquered the Congo Plateau. He and his followers married into the local elite. He was accepted as a ruler of the region. The wealth of Congo was based on trade in ivory, hides, and slaves, and it also used a shell currency popular in Western Africa. Uh, the Congo king oversaw a vast empire with several kingdom under its uh, kingdoms under its control. Most of its history was verbal until the late 16th century. Uh, it didn't get around decently documenting uh, its history until the 17th century, and there were many other various complex and advanced African kingdoms. So that is just a brief overview of some of Africa's, you know, larger and more notable ancient empires. So why lay out all of that history today? Well, it's just to show that, you know, uh, pre-European colonization and exploitation, Africa had its own distinct autonomous cultures. And I think that's just kind of to dispel that stereotype that it was just, you know, just nothing but people running around with, you know, spears and loincloths, and that's just, that's not true. That is historically inaccurate. Uh, there were tribes. There were tribes of small hunter-gatherers, uh, you know, uh, but there was uh, a, a lot of other advanced civilizations as well, you know, people doing their own shit. Now, was life perfect in Africa before Europeans showed up? Or was it some paradise that colonial Europeans destroyed? No, that's not the case. They had problems. They had war and hardship like, you know, all of humanity does. But overall, while there are no stats out there to attest to this, uh, they seem to be much better off on their own. Life seemed to be overall similar to life for the American Indians, you know, in, in that it was better before Europeans showed up and subjugated them. So, so what was life like for the average African before colonialism? Well, let's talk about that a bit. Uh, first off, let's get into slavery. Slavery did exist before colonialism. 
so let's discuss the the history there. Slavery and slave trading was a thing in Africa long before Europeans showed up. So, you know, for people who were slaves in Africa, uh, life did suck before the Europeans showed up. In fact, slavery does go back to ancient times in almost all cultures. The Romans had slaves and in ancient times. It wasn't a black versus white thing. I think that's how a lot of people tend to think about it today, and that is historically inaccurate. Uh, sometimes, oftentimes, it was a we kicked the shit out of your culture, and now you fuckers belong to us thing. Slaves weren't just laborers or household servants either. They could be highly educated. You know, they could be tutors. They could be highly skilled warriors. Think the gladiators. You know, and they also had no rights. Slavery was super common in the ancient world. The Mongols had slaves. Ancient China had slaves. And who enslaved all those people? The fucking lizard Illuminati. That's who. Wake up. To quote highly mentally unstable visionary David Icke, human race, get off of your knees. Can't wait to learn a little more, uh, a little more about David Icke each week with Secret Suck. So much insane and detailed knowledge, quote unquote, in one prolific lunatic's head. But anyway, back to our real history. The Romans had various sources of slaves. They had war, birth, piracy. Uh, you know, people as far as like slaves, you know, who were born slaves, uh, slaves taken to war, slaves, you know, uh, taken in fucking pi- pi- pirate like ship captures. And, uh, and and they had you know long distance trade coming in from outside the empire, you know uh, war was the most important way that you know uh, the, the the main reason Romans had slaves. The commanding general would determine the fate of war captives, who whom the Romans considered part of the plunder. So they kick somebody's ass, you know, if they want to just take all the dudes and instead of killing them, they want to just you know keep them as slaves. Out they. They could do that back then. And slavery was super common in Africa way back in the days of ancient Egypt during the Egyptian New Kingdom era, uh, fifteen fifty. To 1175 BCE, slaves, servants, and peasants, really just other forms of slavery, made up 80% of the population. Slavery was present, yeah, in various forms. Outright ownership of another human being, indentured servitude, forced labor, slaves built the pyramids. Um, And then between the 7th and 15th century, the trans-Saharan and East African slave trades opened up um, with the new Muslim empires spurred by the gradual expansion of slavery from within Africa. Uh, the slave trades contributed to the development of powerful African states on the southern fringes of the Sahara and in the East African interior. The spread of Islam from uh, Arabia into Africa after the religion's founding in the 7th century AD affected the practice of slavery and slave trade in West, Central, and East Africa. Arabs had practiced slave raiding and trading in uh, Arabia for centuries prior to the founding of Islam. Slavery was an accepted, you know, component of Islamic traditions. Slavery is also, by the way, condoned in the Bible. I feel like some Christians and Muslims get, uh, you know, embarrassed uh, about this now and, and try to interpret it away. But, you know, it happened. It was, it's just part of history. Uh, the world was a different place back then. And slavery was just very common in pretty much uh, all of the worlds. You know, these uh, various American Indians, you know, would, would take slaves when they defeated another, you know, tribe or nation. So, uh, of course, it's going to show up in the Quran and in the Bible. And biblical slavery was not racist in its origin. It was a one group conquered another group and sold them to a third group uh, kind of deal, you know, similar to the Romans. The, the uh, ec- economies of various African states were dependent on slave trading. People like gold and jewels were, were a limited natural resource with you know economic importance. Neighboring states competed with another, one another for trade, which led to wars, which in turn led to the capture of more slaves. Uh, slave raiding in West, East, and Central Africa became more common and wide-ranging. Also, by the 9th century, seafaring Muslims from uh, Arabia and Persia had made their way down to the, in, uh, the Indian Ocean to the coast of East Africa, obtaining African slaves in ports from Mogadishu and present-day Somalia. Uh, to Safala in present-day Mozambique and conveying them to Western Asian cities to work. The culture of the East African uh, coastal, coastal regions was strongly influenced by Arab and Persian traders, many of whom intermarried with Africans, thus producing the Swahili people and that particular African culture. So, you know, life for the slave, again, you know, sucked in Africa, sucked in the Middle East and Europe, just like it did, you know, for American slaves later on. Uh, slaves have never had it great. So now let's talk about life for the average non-slave African. Uh, what was that like in ancient Africa for that person? Well, you know, it varied like it does for all people. It's a, it's a huge continent with a lot of different cultures. Uh, in, in the advanced civilizations, primarily and almost exclusively found along Africa's coasts, there were universities and urban centers. You know, there were scholars, soldiers, royals, religious clerics, priests, walled cities, more. There were classes of people like there were in ancient civilizations, you know, royals all the way down to slaves. There was trade with the rest of the civilized world. And then there was the, um, you know, pre-colonial kind of life of Africa's uh, interior. Due to the dense jungles of Central Africa and lack of historical trade routes, 
life for many Africans in the center of the continent existed in, in similar form to that of pre-colonial American Indian civilizations. Life was similar to it is uh, still today for some Amazonian tribes, similar to how it is today for certain tribes in the remote interior jungles of Papua New Guinea. You know, and of course life was similar. Tr uh, tribes were geographically isolated from other tribes, which made you know, evolution into a culture with urban centers and agricultural, uh, agriculture impossible. And, and that's how a quote-unquote modern culture develops, when not everyone has to hunt, fish, or take care of the young. You know, you get some large farms now and a fortress, and, and suddenly farms and farmers can provide food for more people than just themselves. You know, and the other people who don't now have to farm, they get to do uh, specialized forms of labor. You know, they get to, you know, making some advanced pottery and blacksmithing, making their weapons and stuff. You know, a fortress can defend more than just a few royalty members and soldiers, and now merchants get going. You know, they, now they can start trading with other cultures, you know, that they, they can learn from. You know, so more knowledge gets passed around. A written language is developed to keep track of all the learning, to keep track of all the trading, make sure who's, you know, uh, what the value is of the goods and with money and all that. Scholars pop up, universities come together, and industry expands. And that's how you get the beginnings of an industrial culture. But that doesn't happen in a thick jungle where you're basically just trying to avoid death from fucking pesky-ass lions and cheetahs and shit, you know, and big-ass snakes. And the jungle is too dense to cut out, you know, a proper farm without proper tools. So, you know, there were tribes, there were kingdoms, there were cities, there were farms, there were jungles. You know, there were all different kinds of people. Uh, you know, the empires and civilizations rose and fell, fought with each other, conquered each other, conquered, you know, were conquered themselves. Life was good for some, terrible for others, as, as it always is in the world. Some people had it made while others were exploited. And then the Atlantic slave trade started in the 15th century. And that started to bring around Western Europeans hell-bent on colonial expansion. Portuguese traders, the first colonists to uh, buy African slaves, they sailed down to buy slaves from the kingdom of the Congo and take uh, them to new territories in the Americas. And that's when shit started to get racial. Slavery in the United States uh, began when the first African slaves were brought to the North American colony of Jamestown, Virginia in 1619 to aid in the production of such lucrative crops as tobacco. Uh, there was white slavery at this time, but it wasn't the same. It was called indentured servitude. Uh, servants typically worked from four to seven years in exchange for passage, room, board, lodging, and freedom dues. Uh, while the life of an indentured servant was harsh and restrictive, it was not the same as African slavery. Uh, there were laws that protected some of the indentured servants' rights. Uh, European white indentured servants were still considered human beings. I'm sure that comes as, you know, little consolation to someone who uh, has a master abusing their white ass and, and doesn't let them go at the end of the seven years, you know. But if they were able to, you know, run away and escape and, you know, just got away, they could start a new life somewhere else free from prejudice and, and wanton, just accepted casual violence. Not so for the African slaves. And now with a bunch of new buyers, Spain, England, Portugal, and others, more slaves are being sold than ever before. You know, it's a huge new market. And, and with the new racial element, slaves are arguably being treated worse than they ever have uh, before. Again, no stats to back that up, that particular aspect of, you know, how horribly they were treated. But the average African slave who stayed in Africa probably, I'm guessing, treated better on average than the average American plantation slave. Um, just with that new racial element. Uh, also, while no records were kept of how many slaves were sold annually before or after the colonization of America, it just stands to reason that due to a new giant market, a brand new market of two massive continents that would be populated mostly by slaves, way more slaves are being sold than ever before. So thanks to Europeans, thanks to some new supply and demand economics, there are now way more African slaves than ever uh, before in the history of the world. Based on shipping records, at least 4 million would make it to Brazil, at least 2 million to the British West Indies, all in all, conservative estimates place at least 11 million West African slaves making it to the New World. No historical evidence suggests anywhere near that number were headed uh, to Europe, the Middle East, or Asia prior to American colonization. And then in the 19th century, Europeans decided you know, not just to trade with Africa and take its people, but just to take the entire continent the fuck over. Carve it up and, and, and make as much off its natural resources as possible. And this decision has, le has led to a level of turmoil previously unknown in Africa that is still felt there today. So now that we have a basic understanding of the history of Africa's ancient civilizations, what life was like roughly, you know, for the average African, uh, a little background with the, with the slave trade, let's dig into proper colonization, the proper colonization of Africa and its repercussions with a little time-suck timeline of European imperialism. 
Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. All right, 1441. Quick look way back before we jump into Africa's mass invasion. A young Portuguese ship captain named Jumbo McScooter sails to Africa. Uh, okay, his name was not Jumbo McScooter. His name was uh, Antao uh, Gun- Guncalves. But how great would it be if just, just one old mariner of note was named Jumbo McScooter? If anyone ever invents a time machine and goes back, could you please, please try to convince as many people as possible to change the name of their kids to Jumbo McScooter, boy or girl? Uh, that'd be great, you know, just to have that show up in a history book. Anywho, anywho uh, in town, not Jumbo McScooter, Goncalves uh, sailed to West Africa in 1441, hoping to acquire seal skins and oil after obtaining his cargo. Uh, he called a meeting of the 21 sailors who accompanied him and unveiled his plan to increase their profits by bringing captives back home to the prince. And if you're thinking that was super fucked up for him to just decide to grab some people as loot, well, you know, you're right. And it was just what people did back then. Again, at this point, motivation is still not racial. It was more about exploiting the loophole of the laws of the day. As we already know now, slavery was just a way of life, basically, for all cultures throughout history until just very recently in the grand scheme of things. However, in Europe at this time, there were laws that forbid the enslavement of Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Uh, Africans, uh, you know, living in living in Europe. Africans, however, be, however, being pagan, technically still fair game. So they officially became fair game in 1452 when Pope Nicholas V began issuing a series of papal bulls, not only legalizing African slave trade, but encouraging it. Uh, felt like it was good for the spread of his Christian empire. Seriously, how fucked is that? He, he issued a mandate to the Portuguese king, Alfonso V, to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery— And to apply and appropriate to himself and his successors the kingdoms, dukedoms, counties, principalities, dominions, possessions, and goods. And to convert them to his and their use and profit. Wow. And God said, let them be exploited. And a Saracen, by the way, was meant to be an African Muslim in this context. So the Pope has even expanded possibilities, you know, for those who could be taken as slave. He was like, yeah, yeah, I know we're not supposed to enslave Muslims here in Europe, but uh, in Africa it's okay. And the Portuguese, with the post blessing, they went after it, man. By the early 16th century, an estimated 10% of Lisbon, Portugal's population would be of African descent, using God's will as a rationalization for slave trading. So that's that's fun. Uh, wh- why are you taking human beings with families and hopes and dreams and interests and desires and ripping them from their native land and selling them to someone who will use, abuse, objectify, exploit, subjugate, and possibly even murder them? Why, it is but for the glory of the Lord, of course. No, it was for money. It was for money, money. Portugal was a Catholic nation, and the Catholic people, you know, they tithed money to the church. And the more money they made, the more uh, they had to tithe. And as Catholics expanded into the New World, uh, the church, you know, bought land itself, you know, firsthand sometimes. They had their own plantations in some places and other businesses as they set up their missions. And slavery also just, you know, fueled their fucking tax base, essentially, fueled their ability to expand, create a broader base for tithing income. You know, they can make they can make a lot more money if they're uh, if they're you know fellow Catholics are over there you know kicking some ass in some plantations. So in 1502, the first African slaves reach the New World, and then millions follow until the slave trade is finally abolished in the 1860s. Brazil wouldn't emancipate its slaves until 1888. It was the last American country to do so, and now a lucrative business for European colonies is over. So they need to make money in different ways especially as numerous New World colonies are becoming independent nations. The American colonial gravy train is drying up, and monarchs and merchants are looking for a new way to make money, and they look to Africa. So around 1880 is when Europe really goes crazy for African colonization. Prior to 1880, some European nations had begun colonizing Africa, but with minimal success. Portugal was the first to do so. Uh, the nation that had also kicked off the Atlantic slave trade. Fucking Portuguese, man. If there's one thing you take away from this episode, it should be that the Portuguese were and currently are the scourge of the earth. The murder rate in Portugal today, 17 times higher than the next most murderous country. Uh, Google Portugal, and you'll find almost nothing but photos of Portuguese monsters raping and murdering each other in broad daylight Oftentimes in the middle of the street because that's they, they're so ignorant they don't know how to do anything else. When a recent survey was taken asking Portuguese citizens what their favorite hobbies were, 
Uh, most of them didn't understand the question because most of them can't even speak their own language. But of the ones who could, the po- most popular answer was murder, followed by rape, followed by a tie between soccer and marathon running. Seriously, they actually are very good at marathon running. The rest of that fucking shit of, was, of course, made up. And I apologize uh, to my Portuguese time suckers. That was just a fun little tirade to go on. Uh, no, way back in 1482, Mariner Diogo Cao had reached uh, uh, the mouth of the Congo River, and Portugal began setting up its first African trading posts. In 1497, Bartholomew Diaz rounded the Cape of uh, Good Hope, you know, right down the tip of uh, southern Africa. In 1498, Vasco da Gama reached India and it's in Africa's eastern coast. And along the eastern coast of Africa, the Portuguese had conquered Islamic port cities in Mozambique and farther north, seized uh, the ports at Brava, Kilwa, and Mombasa. And by the late 18th century, the Portuguese had the small colonies of Cape Verde. Uh, they had uh, Guinea-Bissau and uh, Sao Tome and Principe in West Africa and uh, much more extensive but largely undeveloped colonies of Angola and Mozambique and Southern Africa. However, they hadn't really colonized these areas. They basically just had the coastlines. They had some trading outposts uh, for slave trading on the coasts. The interior belonged to them in theory only, kind of similar to how America expanded its borders with the uh, Louisiana Purchase. But, you know, but they still had to settle most of that land with their colonists, with their people. You know, it was still being lived on by American Indian tribes and nations who would have been like, what, you, you guys own this? Nah, 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 bro. Uh, you still have to fight us for this shit. We live here, motherfucker, and do not currently give a single fuck about your laws and your settlers. It, it wasn't until 1880 that Europe began to really understand much about Africa's interior, largely due to the explorations of some adventurers, such as the Scottish Dr. Livingstone, I presume. Yes, that Dr. Livingstone. Uh, Dr. Livingstone was a Scottish uh, medical doctor and Christian missionary. He was born in 1813, uh, who wanted to abolish African slavery. He'd spend most of the thirty last 30 years of his life exploring Africa in an attempt to humanize his people, establish trade routes between Europe and his people so that Africa could economically sustain itself and modernize according to European industrial standards and keep from being exploited. And, of course, become Christian. You know, he wanted to save the people of Africa from Europe. Unfortunately, all he did really was help just kind of speed up the opposite. Uh, Dr. Livingstone, uh, he started off his, his African interior exploration in Cape Town, a beautiful city on the South African coast, in 1841. He then sailed east to Port Elizabeth and then went inland uh, to, to uh, Koruman, where he took up his first missionary post as a, as a mission established uh, – at a mission established in 1821 by Robert Moffat. He then pushed his uh, search for converts northward into untried uh, you know, country where the population was reputed to be more numerous, making it to Kolobeng and building a mission there about 600 miles north from Port Elizabeth. By the summer of 1842, he had already gone farther north than any other European into the difficult Kalahari country and had familiarized himself with the local languages and cultures. And now uh, we're going to take a quick brief break from this overview to talk about him getting attacked by a lion. Has nothing to do with uh, colonization of Africa, but it's just interesting as shit. In 1844, while attempting to establish a mission in Mabatsa, uh, a remote location not far from Kolobeng, a uh, homeboy was mauled by a lion, which I'm guessing was as terrible as it sounds. It wasn't the first time Dr. Livingstone uh, was around the lion attack. As early as 1842, uh, he'd seen, <laughs> quote, a woman actually devoured in her garden by a lion and had noticed that there was a plague of these animals around Mabatsa. Uh, I think that's when I would strongly consider heading back to England. Just how was Africa? I thought you were going to stay longer. I was, but after several bouts of malaria and after barely escaping attacks from the bulls, those damn Dutch farmers who were really not cool with my ideas about emancipating African people, I was really starting to miss home. And then one day, when I was looking out uh, the mission window into the garden, I thought maybe I'll stay. It was a beautiful day, green grass and trees for miles and a big blue sky. This beautiful woman... I was pulling weeds from, a, from around some corn we'd planted. So serene, so peaceful. And then a lion ran over and jumped on her and peeled her ribs open with its teeth and shook around like a rag doll and ate her. And then, uh, while watching her quite literally being eaten, I thought, now, nah, bro, fuck this place. I'm out. Now, here's how, now, here's how Livingstone himself uh, got attacked. So he's already seen that. And then on February 16th, 1844, Livingstone was uh, working on a ditch when some natives uh, started screaming for him to help them kill a lion that had just dragged off some of their sheep. As Livingstone put it later, I very imprudently ventured across the valley in order to encourage them to destroy him. Uh, Livingstone grabbed a gun but failed to alert anyone else to come with him. He ran up, found the lion, fired both barrels at it, 
hitting it, but only wounding the beast. And then as the lion charged him, he tried to reload, which had to have been stressful as shit. Uh, and he wasn't able to reload fast enough. And the lion jumped on him, bit down on his arm, shook him around, as he would later describe, like a terrier dog does a rat. Uh, Livingstone's upper arm was splintered at once, and the lion's teeth made a series of gashes that would look like gunshot wounds. He had to have been thinking about that lady he watched getting eaten in the garden as he's now getting tossed around. I can't imagine the terror you would feel. Well, Livingstone would have, would have certainly died, but help showed up in the form of a dude named uh, Mabalwe, an elderly African Christian convert uh, Livingstone had brought over from Kurlman as a teacher, and Mabalwe snatched the gun, loaded, fired both barrels, and didn't hit shit. Whoops. Uh, he did manage to really piss off the lion. And, and the lion now left uh, Dr. Livingstone, uh, came after him. Now Mabawe is getting attacked, badly bitten on the thigh. And then some other dude tries to help, uh, gets bitten on the shoulder. And then luckily, the lion just drops dead. Uh, killed at last by the uh, wounds that you know uh, Dr. Livingstone had uh, inflicted upon it earlier with his gunshot. And then Dr. Livingstone, being the only doctor for hundreds of miles, has to supervise the setting of his own badly fractured arm himself and suture his own bite wo- wounds. Uh, luckily, both he and Mabalwe would survive, although Livingstone would permanently lose some functionality in his broken arm. I would definitely be out after that shit happened. Like, for sure. Uh, why are you heading back to England, Dr. Livingstone? Lions, motherfucker! I am very, very sick of lions! Uh, but Dr. Livingstone does not head back. Uh, he does some further expeditions. By 1849, he'd press onwards, after all that, into the interior of Africa and become the first European to make it to Lake Nagami. By 1854, he reaches Luanda on the West African coast. In 1855, goes back east, all the way to the east coast of Africa, present-day Mozambique. Uh, then goes up to coast in 1862, all the way to uh, Mikindani, uh, cuts inland again to Lake Nyasa in 1866, heading further inland, all the way up to Lake Victoria in 1871, and then down to Chitambo, where he would die in 1873. Uh, he actually died in his tent of unknown causes. He'd battled various illnesses in Africa for years. Uh, and he was found uh, just dead, kneeling in prayer next to his bed. That's, that's pretty nuts. Uh, he also uh, found time to head back to England and visit his family in between all that, uh, give speaking tours throughout the British Isles and publish his findings. Really incredible dude who needs his own suck. To get from London to Cape Town by boat, by the way, it would take roughly 100 days, over three months. And that was just to get to the place where you would begin your journey of your exploration into inland Africa. Can you imagine that? That is that's just unfathomable to me now. Like, you can get from any city in the world to any other city in the world, what, two days max. Usually, you can do it in under 24 hours. You know, most of the time, uh, almost any place under 36. Can you imagine taking almost a third of a year just to get to the place where you start your journey to another place? And both of those places, in terms of amenities, fucking suck. No AC. Lots of bugs. Lots of disease. Not fun. Uh, it's not like you're on a cruise ship, you know, getting there either with water slides, jacuzzi, entertainers, casino, buffets. Get some eating some eating from some of those buffets. No, man, you're on a shitty boat with a bunch of people who probably stink, mostly dudes, limited sanitation, stormy seas, you know, uh, you get dirty, fucking rats, insects, disease, you know, those are common. Livingstone wasn't rich, so he probably didn't have like a private cabin, probably just, you know, down below deck, rocking around with the riffraff, listening to the constant creaks of big wooden boat or steamship, sleeping on some, you know, cot or the thinnest of mattresses. I mean, you know, compared to today, I bet good mattresses sucked back then. They certainly weren't sleeping on Lisa mattresses. Yes, today's Time Suck is brought to you by Lisa. Driven by the mission to provide a better place to sleep for everybody, Lisa is an innovative direct-to-consumer online mattress brand that is also socially conscious. All Lisa mattresses are malaria-free. Not a single Lisa mattress features creepy bugs that would ruin a good expedition. And not only do Lisa mattresses have nothing to do with colonial imperialism, Lisa is actually socially conscious. For every 10 mattresses Lisa sells, they donate one to a shelter through their 110 program. They also plant one tree for every mattress sold and donate 1% of each employee's time to volunteer for local causes. And they're comfy as shit. I wish I could bring my Lisa on the road with me when I tour. Hotel mattresses don't compare to a patented universal adaptive feel with three premium foam layers, including my favorite layer, a two-inch Avena foam top layer for cooling and breathability. Love not getting too hot when I sleep. So try a Lisa mattress in your own home for 100 nights risk-free. Available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Germany online with free shipping. This 100% American-made mattress ships compressed in a box 
right to your door and then unfolds with the use of some kind of powerful magic. Or try it at the Lisa Dream Gallery in Soho, New York City, and Virginia Beach, and over 80 West Elm stores nationwide. And best part, get $100 off when you go to lisa.com slash timesuck. That's L-E-E-S-A dot com slash timesuck. Link in the episode description. All right, back to talking about people who would have killed for a nice mattress on their long, terrible journey. Terrible journeys full of terrible food. You know, and then, uh, yeah, eating off a very small, limited, horrific menu, you know, like boiled, salted meats, oatmeal, stale bread. It would have been worse than traveling on a Greyhound bus by day and sleeping in seedy budget motels by night for three straight months. No, thank you. Oh, uh, and then to get inland, you know, he takes steamer ships up rivers, little tiny ones, and then just w- walk around through the jungle. He'd walk for weeks on end, just walking, carrying shit. Man, fuck that. Being an explorer sounds terrible when you really think about what it was. When you think about how far you had to go without showers, how many bugs you'd run into. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, it, it'd be fun to be like a old, you know, old timey explorer if you if you could have done that in a nice air conditioned Land Rover, pulling a fully loaded Airstream or something, packed with some snacks. You know, heavy on the nacho cheese Doritos, light on the malaria. That doesn't sound too bad. Uh, there was another notable explorer, European explorer, uh, who began mapping the, the African interior. A uh, guy, guy by the name of John Hanning Speak, officer in the British Indian Army, who made three exploratory expeditions into Africa, born on May 4th, 1827, dying on September 15th, 1864. This dude had some adventures straight out of some Indiana Jones outtakes. 50, 1854, uh, this dude makes his first voyage to Africa, first arriving in Aden, where he asked permission from the local political resident of the British outpost to cross the Gulf of Aden and collect specimens uh, in Somaliland for his family's natural history museum. Uh, Somaliland was considered too dangerous and his request was denied. So Speak then asked to join an expedition uh, to leave for Somaliland led by the already famous explorer Richard Burton. And Richard Burton brought him along because he had traveled in remote regions alone before, had experience collecting and preserving natural history specimens, and had done some astro- uh, astro- uh, 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 ast- astronomical – there we go – astronomical surveying. And then the trip went really, really bad. Uh, this little tale also, like Dr. Livingstone's lion attack, has nothing to do with the colonization of Africa, but it was an incredible tale and too incredible uh, that I came across to skip over. So while camped outside Berbera, uh, these guys were attacked at night by 200 spear-wielding Somalis. One member of Burton's crew was killed by a spear. Burton himself was seriously wounded by a javelin impaling both of his cheeks. That's how it was described, the one I read. A javelin impaling both of his cheeks. As in face cheeks, which is even worse than butt cheeks. Holy shit. Javelin through the face. Javelin into the mouth. And somehow doesn't just fall down and die. Uh, Speak was also wounded. And he was the only one to be captured. After uh, taking a javelin to the fucking face, Burton still managed to escape. Pretty tough dude. Uh, But he was pretty tough looking after that as well. Man, javelin scars on each side of his face. That's a guy you don't mess with. The the dude who survives a a javelin going through his face. He can probably take your best shot. You know, unless you have a gun, you run from that guy. He He can take your best stab. You know, we know he can take your best javelin. You know, he's done it. Well, uh, Speak was tied up and stabbed several times with a spear, which I gotta say sounds, uh, worse than getting stabbed a bunch with a knife. I feel like a spear stab is deeper and more psychologically terrifying than a knife stab. One spear thrust, uh, cutting through his thigh along his femur, uh, exits, uh, man, showing tremendous determination, uh, he used his bound fist to give a punch to his attacker in the face and runs off. Seriously, the old, the old tied up hands, just had a spear grow through my leg, double fist face punch. Standard beginning karate technique. Pretty sure you learned that one, uh, your third or fourth day of karate class. That's, that's when they tie up your hands, spear you in the leg, and see what you can do to escape. Well, after fighting off his spear-stabbing captor, uh, Speak is chased by more Somalis with spears, and he Indiana Joneses the shit out of himself and dodges spears and escapes and rejoins Burton and another explorer. The trio eventually manages to escape onto a boat passing along the coast, and, and I'm guessing they go on to tell that story every time they sit down and have a drink at a bar for the rest of their lives. Ah, you, su- you survived being shot twice. It's, that's cute. I took a spear. I took a spear to my fucking face. Uh, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know how you top that one. Speak would uh, later venture back into Africa, spears be damned, several more times. He'd lead the first expedition to Lake Victoria during a search for the source of the Nile River. And then he died of an accidental gun, uh, self-inflicted gunshot wound uh, back in England in 1864. So just whoops. You know, even tough guys can accidentally shoot themselves to death, I guess. 
Okay, but the excitement of, of these guys' uh, expeditions, you know, really gets Europe going. Uh, and speak like Livingstone is, is probably, by the way, worthy of his own suck. And I mentioned these guys today just to give a little example of early expeditions that began to A, map Africa's interiors for later European colonization, and B, uh, create a lot of curiosity around Africa and Europe. And again, you know, these expeditions, you know, like uh, other similar expeditions, you know, at that time, paved the way for colonialism. Uh, the curiosity would lead to more and more expeditions, and then it, it would lead to the mad scramble to take over Africa and exploit it for its natural resources. So 1870. In 1870, a few years before Livingstone has died in Africa, uh, only roughly 10% of Africa was under European control. And, and again, the control is really limited to a few coastal cities. By 1914, this number would increase to 90%. 90% of Africa would belong to European imperialists by the beginning of World War I. Okay, the big push for colonization really accelerated in 1884 with the Berlin Conference. The European imperialist push into Africa was motivated by three main factors, economic, political, and social. But mostly economic. It's always mostly about money. The economic desire for Africa developed in the 19th century following the collapse of the profitability of the slave trade, its, its abolition, and suppression, as well as the expansion of the European capitalists during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the imperatives of capitalist uh, industrialization included the demand for raw materials and the search for profitable investment outlet. Again, the primary motivation for European intrusion was economic. They had rich as shit industrialists and monarchies who realized they could, money, uh, they could make money off of Africa, lots of it, and so the decision was made to take it. Uh, other factors also played an important role in the colonization process, like the political impetus derived from the impact of inter-European power struggles, competition for preeminence, the old national ego. Who can swing the biggest international dick? Who has the most land? Uh, Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, Italy, Portugal, Spain, they were all competing for power in Europe, and one way to demonstrate national preeminence was through the acquisition of foreign territories around the world. And Africa had the most remaining land that Europeans felt like you know they had a reasonable chance of taking. And then there was a social element. As a result of industrialization, unemployment, poverty, homelessness, social displacement from rural areas, and so on, it was becoming problematic in Europe. These social problems developed partly because, you know, not all uh, people could be absorbed by new capitalist industries. So one way to resolve this problem was just to acquire colonies and export the surplus population. And that led to the establishment of settler colonies in Algeria, uh, Tunisia, uh, South Africa, Nambia, Angola, uh, Mozambique, Central African areas like Zimbabwe, Zambia. And these new settlements in turn led to the colonization of other parts of Africa. So similar to the colonization of America, right? You got a bunch of unhappy poor people living in poverty. You got merchants looking for new revenue streams, and you have European empires looking to expand their empires. You know, show that their dick is bigger. You know, increase their tax base. You know, so they can defend themselves. You know, not be taken over by other European empires. So colonization is a win for everyone. Uh, everyone, uh, of course, except for the people already living in the place. You're going to take over. Things are shit for them. So it was the interplay of these economic, political, and social factors and forces that led to the mad scramble for Africa. And the scramble was so intense that there were fears it could lead to conflicts and war. So to prevent this, the German chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, remember him from way back in Bonus Suck 3, the rise of Hitler's Third Reich? Well, Otto uh, convened a diplomatic summit of European powers in the late 19th century. Uh, this was the, the famous Berlin-West African Conference more generally known as the Berlin Conference, held from November 1884 to February 1885. And the conference produced a treaty known as the Berlin Act, with provisions to guide the conduct of the European competition in Africa. Some of its major articles were as follows. Uh, the principle of notification, uh, notifying other powers of a territorial annexation. So <laughs> just basically like, uh, uh, hey, Germany, this is Britain. Uh, we're going to take a couple hundred million acres south of Nile. Is that cool? All right, thanks, bro. Uh, then there was the principle of effective occupation to validate the annexations. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to declare that you're going to have some land, you got to send some people there to live on it. Uh, freedom of trade in the Congo Basin, freedom of navigation on the Niger and Congo Rivers, freedom of trade uh, to all nations, uh, suppression of the slave trade by land and sea. Uh, I like this. I think I said uh, Niger, uh, Niger uh, in Congo Rivers. I like this last one as if it morally justifies the rest. Uh, we're going to divvy up the uh, continent amongst ourselves as if uh, there isn't already people there living their lives. But we're going to abolish slavery because, uh, you know, we're good people. 
Uh, the treaty, drawn up without any African participation, provided the basis for the uh, subsequent partition, invasion, and colonization of Africa by various European powers. How fucking nuts is that? These guys just had some meetings to decide how to divvy up a continent that already has a lot of people living on it. You know, that already has a- a- autonomous nations and kingdoms. And-, and this is after these greedy assholes had decided that slavery was wrong. Hello, gentlemen. I I think we can all agree that slavery was uh, terrible and moral and a mistake, and we feel horrible. It was wrong what we did to people of Africa. Yes, you can argue that slavery already existed, but we took it from on pa shop levels to massive slave factory levels, and that was not cool. Not cool. So no more of that. I thought of something much more humane. How about instead of taking slaves out of Africa and shipping them around the world, uh, how about we just take actual continent? Uh, just all of it. Just take it all. Uh, but isn't that, a, in a sense, after the ban of slavery, uh, really just enslaving the entire continent? You know what, asshole? Why don't you get the fuck out of this meeting, Switzerland? No one gives a shit what you think. Just stay in Europe and keep cleaning our dirty money, you pretentious asshole. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that was a Swiss accent, but we're going to go with it for today. Unreal. Unreal. I'm not sure what either one of those accents were, but you get but you get what I'm saying. This is ridiculous. Well, these African kingdoms already in existence weren't terribly happy about all this, as you can imagine. However, it took them a bit to find out exactly what was going on. Uh, at first, a bunch of crafty European politicians and diplomats tricked them with bullshit treaties similar to the bullshit treaties the American government gave to American Indians. Right During and after the Berlin Conference, various European countries sent out agents to sign so-called treaties of protection. Uh, with the leaders of African societies, states, kingdoms, and decentralized societies and empires. So basically, they sold a story along the lines of, hey, dude, Britain over there, they want to fuck your shit up. They are some real a-holes, okay? And, and, and my people back in Berlin, they don't think that's cool. You know, in Germany, we're all about live and let live, you know, protecting the little guys, our kind of thing. So if, if you could sign this little treaty here, it guarantees that we will protect you from Britain. And France. They're dicks too. Oh, and Portugal. Those are some rugged motherfuckers. They're the worst. And then, you know, you know, we'll do business. You know, you run your stuff. We run ours. And everything's cool. And everybody makes money. Everybody wins. Meanwhile, in another freshly partitioned up area of Africa, some other dude is like, look, Germany is planning some shady shit. They, you know, they're, they're about to come old knocking with the big old army. And we here in Britain think that is super not cool. So we're going to cut you in on a little deal. Yeah, African leaders were led to believe that these treaties were just, you know, diplomatic, friendly deals to encourage trade and partnership, make some alliances, get some protection. No, no. These treaties meant that Africans had signed away their sovereignties to European powers that had just tricked them. After discovering that they had, in effect, been tricked and that the European powers now wanted to impose and exercise political authority in their lands, you know, African rulers organized militarily to resist the seizure of their lands and the imposition of colonial domination. They fought back, and their initial resistance took two main forms, guerrilla warfare and direct military engagement. And guerrilla warfare worked much better for the Africans than direct engagement did. Uh, The best, most effective tactic that Africans had was using small groups of organized fighters with a firm knowledge of the terrain to mount classic guerrilla hit-and-run raids against stationary enemy imperialist forces. This was the approach used by the Igbo of southeastern Nigeria against the British. Now, even though the British imperialists swept through Igbo land uh, in three years between 1900 and 1902, and despite the small scale of societies, the Igbo put up protracted resistance. Uh, it was difficult to conquer them completely and declare absolute victory. Long after the British formally colonized Igbo land, they had still not fully mastered the territory. In general, though, over time, the European imperialists eventually beat the rebels, at least in the economic areas of interest that mattered to them. Uh, direct military confrontation, less successful. Didn't work out at all for two main reasons. The 19th century was a period of profound and even revolutionary changes in the political geography of Africa, characterized by the demise of various old African kingdoms and empires, their reconfiguration into different political entities. Some of the old societies were reconstructed and new African societies were founded on different ideological and social premises. Uh, Consequently, African societies were in a state of flux. It was a time of great change. And many were just organizationally weak and politically unstable. They were therefore unable to put up effective resistance against the European invaders. You know, timing is everything. And the timing of the invasion was terrible for the Africans. Uh, The other reason was technological. There was a radical disparity between the technologies of warfare deployed by the contending uh, European and African forces. African forces in general 
uh, fought with bows, arrows, spears, swords. Uh, did have rifles, tended to be old rifles comparatively, uh, and occasional, you know, cavalries. Uh, cavalry, excuse me. The the European forces, beneficiaries of the technical fruits of the Industrial Revolution, fought with more deadly firearms, machine guns, new rifles, artillery guns. You know, it was no contest. You know, it was, it was that you know classic case of bringing a knife to a gunfight. You know, rock beats scissors, heavy artillery beats spears and rifles. It was a slaughter, or rather a series of slaughters. So, by 1900, much of Africa has been colonized by seven European powers. Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, Spain, Portugal, and Italy. After the conquest of African decentralized and centralized states, the European powers set about establishing colonial state systems. The colonial state was the machinery of administrative domination established to facilitate effective control and exploitation of the colonized societies, partly as a result of their origins in military conquest and partly because of racist ideology they also now brought to Africa, the colonial states were authoritarian bureaucratic systems. They imposed their will upon the local people and maintained it by force, without the consent of the governed. They were administered by military officers and civil servants who were appointees of colonial power. And then by 1914, only Ethiopia and Liberia are still independent African nations. The rest of the entire continent is now under foreign uh, imperial control. And then in 1914, things get even more complicated when World War I makes its way to Africa. And then all that let's work together to fuck over Africa and share the spoils, you know, shit from the 1894 Berlin Conference goes out the window. Well, when Germany lost the war, other European powers just took the countries that Germany had just taken from the Africans. So there, you know, there was German South Af- Southwest Africa, there was German West Africa, German East Africa going into the war. Man, they, they were not very, they were not very clever with their names, were they? What shall we call this nation, Chancellor? Where is it in Africa? It is South and West Chancellor. Then we shall call it German Southwest Africa. Next colony. Germans' African colonies uh, acquired in the 1880s weren't uh, well defended to begin with. And then as part of reparations for causing World War I, German Southwest Africa would become part of the Union of South Africa, a British colony. Today, it is Nambia, uh, only recently gaining independence in 1990. Uh, German West Africa would become the current countries of Cameroon, uh, Nigeria, Togo, Ghana, Gabon, uh, the Republic of the Congo, Chad, and the Central Republic. Some of these countries are actually uh, Central African nations that have been taken over by France, but then prior to World War I in 1911, France ceded them over to Germany in exchange for Germany, giving France some disputed land in Morocco. Again, the people actually living in these countries, they don't have shit to say in any of this. You know, they're living their lives, and then one day some French motherfucker is telling them what to do. And the next day, you know, some German dude's telling them what to do. It just had been incredibly confusing. Uh, even better, in addition to having their foreign rulers shuffle them around in World War I, post-World War I, they also had to fight for these assholes. They're given machine guns and basically forced to fight. Roughly 2 million Africans died in World War I fighting for countries they did not want to be ruling them in the first place. Uh, World War I also changed Africa in another way. The military brought a need for a new level of industrialization and urbanization. Outside of coastal cities, early 20th century Africa was extremely rural. Uh, There was a need for labor to keep the machinery, though, of war moving forward. So roads now need to be built to get troops to their proper places. Supplies have to be brought in. Mines are set up for, you know, mine minerals. War effort. Idiots. The internet. All the states are bringing in big labor forces. Housing has to be built for these labor forces. Cities spring up. The way of life changes dramatically for many Africans who are still living more of a rural, hunter-gatherer type lifestyle. Uh, Unfortunately, because of imperial racism, uh, when these cities are put together, they're not put together well for the native Africans. Africans are housed in horrible, unsanitary, and humane conditions. Uh, This creates an environment for the rapid spread of contagious diseases. When the European powers realize they can't just let disease uh, spread rampantly around their new colonies, they do something to help their people out. Uh, They're white people. Uh, Instead of improving living conditions for Africans, they just segregate them. Just get them away from white settlers so if disease spreads, you know, it'll just stay in their section of town type of deal. It's just preposterously messed up. Cities are built in zones, such as in South Africa, where African zones are shanty towns, and other zones are reserved for white Europeans living in relative luxury with the modern amenities. I, I actually saw the residual effects of this urban segregation firsthand years ago doing a comedy festival uh, in the cities of like Johannesburg and Cape Town. It was horrifying. One section of the city, uh, a historical white section, you know, would be nice homes. 
uh, much like you'd see in a, in a nice neighborhood in America or in you know Western Europe. Well manicured streets, nice shops, and trendy little restaurants. All that shit. All the little coffee shops. All that stuff. All the you know popular stores. You know, another section would just be completely unsafe to walk around in. I was driven through some sections in a car with armed drivers. Uh, there was dirt streets, cinder block shanties with no running water, no indoor plumbing, you know, no insulation, even electricity sometimes. Uh, places look so bad. I would rather live in my neighbor's garden shed than in a lot of these places, truly. And it's these places that Africans are living in, working in mines by day, sleeping in these shitty thrown-together huts at night, while the new imperialists are building big proper homes living in comparable luxury. Well, after World War I is over in 1918, things get awesome finally for Africa. Jesus Christ, finally get some good news in this episode. Uh, Britain, for example, builds the world's first free amusement park in Nairobi. For 40 years, it would have the world's longest lazy river, cold beer, cool water, lots of floaties, no segregation, the best. Uh, the most advanced hospital in the world was located in Gaborone, uh, Botswana, for over a decade. Site of the world's first pediatric wing, actually. Residents of French Sudan would have the highest standard of living, uh, you know, in, in, in the world, uh, com- with the exception of Paris and London until 1935. The middle class was actually very wealthy. Uh, it was it was an epic, epic time. An interracial marriage w- was common, even encouraged. Uh, everyone loved each other, and no one was exploited, and the high five was actually invented. So, fuck yeah. Get out of here. None of that happened. Now, things got even worse for the Africans. The economy of Europe is in, in shambles, and to rebuild their economies, Europe turns to Africa's mineral and agricultural wealth. Of course they do. Europe's growing interest in Africa's minerals, blood diamonds, uh, for example, uh, led to her expansion into Africa's interior. The Great Depression that followed, you know, Europe was also affected by the uh, U.S. stock market crash in 1929, worsened the already failing economies of Europe. The, the mining of mineral wealth from Africa required its reorganization of colonial rule, which meant uh, that the autonomy, uh, you know, autonomous ki- chiefs and kings in Africa ha- that had maintained rule over the years would be increasingly dissolved to make room for a more progressive form of government. The result of these changes was that land was taken away from African tribes and residents and chiefs and local empires – and given to white settlers and colonial companies like the British South African Company for farming and mining. And this is comparable to what went on with, you know, uh, American colonial invasion of inland, you know, America, where at first there's like reservations, and then when gold would be found or the farmland would be deemed to be very valuable, they would just be like, nah, I know we said that you could still live here, but get the fuck out now. Uh, you got to give us that. Uh, after World War I, colonial governments began to in- introduce agricultural reforms aimed at further improving their revenues by squeezing more money collected from African farmers. Uh, they're basically feudal medieval monarchies uh, posing as, sen- as 20th century nations. African societies were deeply affected by these changes because most of them were still dependent on agriculture for, you know, their daily survival. You know, that little thing, that little nuisance. Uh, Africans now forced to sell their crops to colonial markets at lower prices that would in turn sell these crops to an international market at a much higher price, which meant, you know, much more money for the overlords and less money for the actual Africans. And then World War II hits in 1939, and another European war spills into Africa. More than a million Africans would end up fighting in World War II in one form or another, and few understood why. Hundreds of thousands of African troops would be sent to Europe during the war. Those who survived would feature almost no recognition for their efforts after the war. In in theory, the men volunteered for their colonial overlords, but in reality, it was forced recruitment. Check out these recent interviews uh, with African World War II veterans. Uh, Senegalese veteran Yoruba remembers uh, the day when the French came to his village. If we men had stayed at home, we would have been taken to court and probably shot dead. So that was his volunteering experience. Uh, you know, what they were to fight for was not explained, said Baby Sai, a veteran uh, from Burkina Faso, then Upper Volta. He said, uh, he's, <laughs> he said, people didn't understand when they heard talk of fascism. We were just told that the Germans had attacked us and considered us Africans to be apes. As soldiers, we could prove that we were human beings. That was it. That was all the political explanation there was at the time. So, I mean, yeah, they're just getting fucked over in so many different ways. Well, at least some good did come out of the soldiers' World War II efforts that would lead to African nations becoming independent states. Whether as prisoners of war or, you know, if they were fighting on the front, the African soldiers came into close contact with European soldiers and with the reality of life in Europe. And that changed their awareness and later their political activity back home. Senegalese writer and filmmaker uh, Soumain Zimbin, uh, himself a former colonial soldier, put it like this. 
In war, we saw the white men naked, and we have not forgotten that picture. Well, this had far-reaching consequences. Uh, during the war, you know, the African soldiers saw their so-called rulers from Europe lying in mud and filth. They saw them suffering and dying, says German journalist Carl Rossell, who spent 10 years researching the topic in West Africa. As a result, they realized that there was no differences between people. And this, in turn, led to many former soldiers joining independence movements in their home countries. Well, then also in 1945... Uh, you know, the United Nations is formed, and part of their formation doctrine is the right for nations to have self-determination. Basically, colonies should be able to govern themselves and not be forced to be subjugated to foreign rule. Well, this new doctrine and international philosophy greatly bolsters Africa's push for independence. And then in June of uh, 1953, Egypt gains independence from Britain. In 1960, Botswana gained its uh, independence from Britain as well. Uh, Gabon and Senegal take over independence from France, and on and on and on. 17 African nations gained independence in 1960 alone. By 1977, 57 African countries had seceded from their former European colonial rulers. But for many of these nations, freedom came at a terrible price. Yeah, there's uh, there's really like every every time in this episode, it seems like oh, this good news they they got something. Ah, uh, no, it actually made life worse. Uh, France specifically was so angry about losing their most profitable source of income for their country that when the people of Guinea uh, decided in 1958 to free themselves and get out of the French colonial empire, the French colonial elite in Paris got so furious that in a historic act of fury, the French administration in Guinea. Uh, destroyed everything in the country which represented what they called the benefits from French colonization. So they just fucking destroyed schools, nurseries, public administration buildings, cars, books, medicine, research institutes, instruments, tractors, cows, horses, pigs are killed in farms, food in warehouses is poisoned and burned. I mean, Jesus. It was obvious that the reason for this immense act of violence and destruction you know, was committed in order to send a warning to the remaining French colonies that if they decided to reject France, you know, there's going to be some fucking consequences. But the other French colonized countries were not intimidated for that long. And so in 1960, you know, the Republic of Togo decided that it wanted or it did not, excuse me, want to be part of the French Empire anymore. Uh, the first president of Togo, uh, Silvanus Olympio, in light of what France did to Guinea, uh, agreed that the Togolese Republic would pay an annual debt to France for the so-called benefits Togo got from French colonization. So that was what he learned from this previous destruction. He's like, okay, we, we want to leave, blah, 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 you know, before you burn all our shit, we're going to pay you for all the great benefits you've given us. Because uh, this was the only way that they could keep the French from destroying their country. Uh, the only problem was that the amount estimated by France uh, was so huge – that they felt that they were owed, uh, that the annual repayment of this so-called colonial debt was close to 40% of the country's total budget in 1961. So as a result, Togo is now uh, economically too unstable to survive as an independent country. So then President Olympio decides that uh, to get you know out of the French colonial money in order to save the economy, uh, that they got to like basically start printing their own currency. And so they do so. And then on January 13, 1963, a squad of soldiers backed by France kills President Olympio, the first elected president of newly independent Africa. And that kind of shit still goes on. 2014, 2014, 14 African countries, as of at least as recent as January 2014, are obliged by France through a colonial pact to put 85% of their foreign reserve into France. Uh, the France Central Bank under French under the French Minister of Finance Control, uh, they are effectively putting in $500 billion every year into the French Treasury. African leaders who refuse are killed or victim of coups. Uh, victim of coups. Uh, those who obey are supported and rewarded by France with lavish lifestyles, uh, while their people endure extreme poverty and depression. So that shit's still going on, man. All right, so let's hop out of this timeline and think about uh, what's going on in Africa today overall. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. All right, so currently Africa, you know, it has, it has other problems. It has Islamic terrorist groups like ISIS and Boko Haram. Uh, it has civil wars in Rwanda and neighboring Burundi. Uh, the move from colonial to independent rule led uh, to violence, radicalized policies under colonial rule led to rivalries between ethnic groups, major contributor to the 1994 Rwandan genocide. Uh, in addition to all the other problems I mentioned with colonization, think about this. 
when those European uh, <laughs> assholes cut up Africa, they didn't cut it up with any thought whatsoever to the boundaries of the existing tribes, kingdoms, and nations, you know. Uh, in some occasions, you know, an existing kingdom could just be split in half. One part of the culture now belongs to one imperial overlord. Uh, another part belongs to another nation, and those nations, you know, may go to war against each other. In, in other cases, two or more different ethnic groups who hated each other, you know, for centuries, uh, you know, been fighting for, for decades or more, are now forced to be part of the same nation. You know, like that's not going to cause problems. For example, in South Africa, there are the Zulu, uh, Zulu, excuse me, and the Hosa, uh, two of many different African cultures and tribes. And for the most part, these two fucking hate each other. Historically, have fought each other. Uh, you know, and now they're you know part of the same nation. And there are tensions like this in other nations all throughout Africa, and that's why there are these civil wars. Now, if Africa had been left alone, would life over there be way better than it is now? Uh, I mean, who knows? But uh, probably, probably be better if European imperialists had decided to work with local African nations and help industrialize them, allowing both the Africans and Europeans to make money together and actually share the wealth rather than, you know, just completely fuck them over. Uh, I'm guessing life for sure would be better. You know, human greed, man, European greed uh, has for uh, sure, without a doubt, been the very worst thing to ever happen to that continent. But that's just what I think. What does... The internet think. All right, time to check in with those idiots of the internet. Well, today I found a video called How the Europeans Divided Africa, posted by Africa Business Pages. And I'm not going to focus on the abject racism in the comment section because there's too much of it and it's tired. Instead, I'll focus on some other uh, different types of wackadoodles, like poster DJ Renee, who writes, we don't need their education and technology. The more Africans get educated, the more they fall behind the white man again. Know the real history. Africa was more advanced a thousand years ago on their own before this so-called education and technology. If any hope, we should start by withdrawing from their systems and beliefs. Hashtag education and hashtag religions. Wow. Uh, why do people do this when they get really mad about something? They reject the entire thing they're mad at. It's, it's that classic throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, did the Europeans fuck up Africa? Yeah, for sure. No one, no one in the right mind is going to argue that. But is everything they brought to Africa horrific? No. Uh, were there universities before Europeans in Africa? Yes, but not as many. Uh, way more because of Europeans. Way more hospitals started showing up after Europeans arrived. Way more cures and vaccinations uh, for horrific, life-killing diseases. You know, Africa was not uh, more advanced a thousand years ago. That is that is full uh, Crystal Holden crazy talk, right? Uh, did, did they have air conditioning a thousand years ago? No. How about indoor plumbing? Uh-uh. How about cars and trains and planes and roads? Nope. You know, they didn't have any of that shit. Travel, travel was not better in Africa uh, a thousand years ago than it is today. And, and now, though, but you think that you just abandon all forms of Western education? Get the fuck out of here. I get the rage, but you've gone to a very logical place. All right? You're going to uh, – no, no one is going to be like, nope, let's get rid of all this. Let's just, uh, let's just go back to uh, you know, some medieval-type uh, lifestyle at best. Uh -uh. User James Morrison goes to an even more logical place, posting slave trade, no mention of Jewish merchants that ran the show. Why do people do this? I swear, you look through any comment section – uh, of any video uh, about something going horribly wrong in history that has more than like a million views, at least one motherfucker has to blame the Jews. It's the Illuminati. They ran the slave trade, the Zionists. I get so tired of that. Did some European Jews uh, make some money off the slave trade in Africa's exploitation? Of course. I'm sure still do, as, as do many other types of people. But they were not running the show. You secret society obsessed, complete lunatic. Man, that stuff is just so – it's just – God, I just feel like it's just out there forever. I feel so sorry for uh, Jewish people when I read about that stuff. We're just like, man, just enough with the fucking Illuminati running shit. Uh, user uh, Minimit uh, Minicapera de decides to fight ridiculous racism with more ridiculous racism, uh, writing, I really hope that the entire of Europe will get nuked, nuked all – to nuked all of these peckerwoods. Uh, okay, now I, I include this partly because it's idiotic to think that, you know, what the Europeans ha have done justifies literally killing all of them today, as if the people living there today uh, were the people living there in the late 19th century. Uh, there are a lot of good white people and a lot of amazing Europeans, just like there are amazing people of all races and from all nations across the world, except Poland, <laughs> except Poland. As I've stated before, they are the worst people ever. 
Kidding, of course. Uh, I also included this post in the Edits of the Internet because the, the, uh, the word peckerwood uh, really makes me laugh. And, and it doesn't make sense in this context. Merriam-Webster defines peckerwood as an insulting and contemptuous term for a rural white southerner. It's white southern poor redneck, of which there are approximately none in Europe. So let's ease up on the new uh, everyone talk and use the correct racial or ethnic slur, which in this case would be Euro trash. You know, you want you what you want to nuke is all Euro trash, if I read you correctly. Not some good old boys in Alabama or some shit. And uh, last one, user Streetway ST goes full idiot, posting Europeans. There are more than fifty European countries, and I can see that the majority of them have never had any colony. What the fuck are you talking about, dude? No one has said that all of the countries in their name form today are the countries that colonized Africa a century or two before. How do you not understand how history works? You know, the, the major colonial powers of Europe in the first half of the 20th century and the last half of the 19th century did do this. How is that hard for you to understand? This dipshit is acting like he just watched a video on American slavery and then is saying, no, not true. I do not have slaves. Never have had. None, have, uh, none of my white friends have had or ever had uh, slaves either. Of course not, dummy. Do you not understand the basic concept of time? Uh, are you unable to process the concept of past tense? A lot of the 50 countries in Europe today didn't have colonies because they weren't fucking countries 100 years ago. You know, they were part of other countries that did have slaves, that did colonize. I hate it when people twist an argument into a place that the person making the initial argument uh, never suggested. You know? Okay. So, so enough of this one today. Enough, enough of this one. Uh, to, to uh, we'll, we'll close on uh, you know uh, a post by user Proudman nine nine eight, who uh, who said what really kind of summed up what I found the rest of this comment section to be, uh, while saying the comment section of this video is pure cancer. Idiots of the internet. Okay, so there we have it. Ho hope you understand Africa a little better now. Uh, I know I do. I know this was a complex, uh, this was a really tricky, tricky episode to put into a narrative. And, and I know uh, just based on comments I've seen on like the iTunes reviews and stuff, I know you guys tend to prefer the, uh, oh, like the biographies and stuff a little more sometimes in these episodes. And that, that those can be a little more entertaining. And I do get that. And, and it's because they're just much easier to do. Like a biography of a person is far easier to construct narratively uh, than it is like a, a concept like this. But I think these concepts are important, and I hope I'm getting better at trying to explain them. I'm making a lot of effort into simplify it as much as possible. Uh, I know that I learned a lot. I understand the chaos of present-day Africa much more because of this episode. I understand the struggle much more. I understand how exploitation continues and has its historical roots, you know, oil drilling, diamond mines, and more. You know, the diamond mines of Africa could be just another suck, you know, all on their own. You know, the continued colonial taxes, that blew my mind. <laughs> the, the, the fucking nerve of some of these places to still tax them in that way. Uh, you know, the, just a level of segregated poverty that exists there, just, you know, that's unlike anything that we have here. And again, I saw that firsthand when I went to South Africa, you know. Uh, you know, my stand-up oh, traveling over the years has led me to some rough neighborhoods in the U.S. You know, Inglewood, Compton, some of the worst neighborhoods in Detroit and you know, and, and uh, East Lansing and Philly and New York. Been through some real rugged little towns of West Virginia and some real rural poverty in Missouri and, and other places. Some, some real heartbreaking poverty in this country. And I can tell you that it has nothing uh, on, on the shit I saw in Africa. It is an entire other level of poverty. And when I saw it, I didn't have a real understanding of, of why it still existed. And now I know. Ah, Okay, and now let's go over what we all just learned, what we all know, uh, and a little new info besides with some top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the colonization of Africa really got going with the Berlin Conference in 1884 when Otto von Bismarck decided that the leaders of Europe needed to sit down and figure out how to carve up a new continent to dick over. Number two. By 1910, over 90% of Africa was under imperial control. Only Liberia and Ethiopia remained independent. Italy tried to take Ethiopia over in 1896 and got its motherfucking ass kicked in the Battle of Edwa. Finally, a victory for Africa. Uh, well, the, the Italians would later kick Ethiopia's ass in 1936. Shit. But the Italians would also get kicked back out in 1941. So back to some good news. A little bit of good news. 
Number three, Africans were forced to fight for their colonial overlords in both World War I and World War II. So while the slave trade was abolished in the late 19th century, slavery in some form continued well into the 20th century. Number four, parts of Africa are still being economically subjugated by other imperial rulers, by former imperial rulers. The French still tax the shit out of Africa to the tune of roughly $500 billion a year. Number five, new info, chaos, still reigns in Africa today. In 2014, uh, Africa experienced more than half of worldwide conflict incidents despite having only about 16% of the world population. Right now, more than 250,000 children in war-torn South Sudan are at risk of imminent death because of severe malnutrition, a United Nations official has recently said. The country has been undergoing civil war since 2013. The ongoing conflict has resulted in the death of tens of thousands and the displacement of a quarter a quarter of the country's 12 million person population. Uh, it's also uh, affected more than half of its child population, according to UNICEF. Some 2.4 million children have been forced to flee their homes since the war broke out. More than 2,300 children have been killed and 19,000 have been recruited into fighting for armed groups. Here's some more depressing stats. More than a quarter of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa are poorer now than they were in 1960, with no sign that foreign aid, however substantive, uh, will end poverty there. Last year, perhaps the most striking illustration of this came from Liberia, which has received massive amounts of aid, foreign aid, for a decade in 2011, according to the OECD. Uh, official development aid to Liberia totaled $765 million, made up 70%. Uh, 3% of its gross national income. That sum was even larger in 2010. But last year, every one of the 25,000 students who took the exam to enter the University of Liberia failed. Jesus. All of the aid is still failing to provide a decent education to Liberians. So what is to be done? How is Africa to be helped? How do you stabilize governments and countries that have seen virtually no stability in the last century and a half at least? How do you end an exploitation model that has existed for so terribly long. Many of Africa's governments are extremely corrupt. Of course they are. Their leaders grew up in a world of corruption. Well, I wish I had some answers. Uh, for right now, I think it's just something we need to keep thinking about. And if people want to read more about the last throes of Af African exploitation, my editor, uh, Jesse Dobner, says uh, you should read uh, this book called King Leopold's Ghost – a Story of Greed, Terror, and Heroism in Colonial Africa. I guess it's a great book, uh, according to Jesse, that is equally informative and horrific and just makes you think further about this issue, which I do think is important. Time suck. Top five takeaways. So that is imperialism in Africa, and my jaw is completely numb. It just sucked an entire continent. Uh, shout out to small town sucker real quick, Kelby. Happy birthday, dude. Uh, Tecumseh, your buddy says, hey, uh, and some announcements. Uh, and again, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Again, I know it was complicated, but I, but I hope it was fun. It was very interesting for me and a nice break from the pace of, uh, kind of recent episodes. Uh, Houston, Dallas, Brea, Cleveland, Charlotte, Atlanta, Huntsville. So much more uh, up at dancummins.tv, the newly designed dancummins.tv. Click the link in today's podcast description to listen to my new album, maybe on The Problem, on Pandora Premium for free. That is out now. Uh, that link gives you a free 30-minute uh, trial of Pandora Premium if you're not a premium user already. And then when the time is up, you know, you just come back, click the link, and then you'll have enough time to finish the rest of the album. And it's just all laid out there uh, as an album, which is awesome. The Patreon account is live. For those of you who want to sign up uh, early to become Space Lizards in just a couple of days, thanks to all those of you, uh, thanks to those of you who have done so already. Due to my tour schedule, I actually recorded this episode five days ago. I actually recorded it a day after this past Friday's episode. Uh, it's kind of odd to do it that way. Um, so I have no idea how many people are signed up, but I'm guessing – Based on early last week, it's between 500 and 1,000 people. 500, 1,000 space lizard. It's fucking happening. It's really happening. Uh, you won't be charged $5 until February 1st, and that's when some new space lizard features on the app and the website arrive. That's when the first piece of space lizard merch comes out. That's when the secret suck podcast will be uh, – you'll have a little intro uh, episode. Not really an episode, just an explanation kind of episode. And then, you know, February 8th is when the first one will be there. The age of the space lizard is hours away. Link to the Patreon profile uh, is your ticket into the exclusive world of the Space Lizard in the episode description. Patreon just being used to collect that $5 a month and send occasional Space Lizard messages to explain shit, troubleshoot problems, etc. 
And again, February 8th will be the, be the first, you know, full episode. So we have time to kind of build it out with all your space lizard voice messages. Uh, you'll be able to listen to Secret Suck on the app and on the website. And that's it. That's the only place. The space lizards are here. Join us. And if you're on the fence about being a space lizard, but you love my stand-up and you want to get my second new 2018 album, Feel the Heat, you can only do so by signing up. One month subscription, five bucks, and the album is yours. And then if you want to cancel, you still get to keep that $5 album. And I, and I think it's pretty funny. I had a good time making it. Uh, here's a little sample of what's on it. Like, even with the best messages, like, the golden rule was always my favorite. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. That's a great message. And it's beautiful for most people. But what if you're a weirdo? What if you're a social deviant, some degenerate? You might want some creepy shit done unto you that I would rather not have done unto me or unto others around me. What if you're some masochistic pervert? That's your thing. You get pleasure from pain. All right, that's fine. If that's what you want to do, but that's not what I want to do. All right, what if your ultimate fantasy, this is what you would like done unto you. Your ultimate fantasy is you'd like to be waiting to get coffee in the morning. You just woke up. You're in that surreal, pre-caffeinated, hazy part of the day. Just, you know, still got crusty stuff in your eyelashes. Just still getting a grip on things. And then you're about to get your coffee. And right as you're about to get your coffee, you feel hot breath on the back of your neck. Like, what? A large, aggressive stranger has snuck up behind you. You're like, hey, what are you? And then they just bend you over the counter, pull on your pants, pull off your underwear, and they shove a popsicle up your ass to the stick. <laughs> yes, to the stick. <laughs> now you're in a real pickle. I hope you liked that little teaser. Uh, the crowd that night and myself had a great time. Uh, thanks to Sidney Shives, Harmony Velikamp, Jesse Dobner, and the entire Time Suck team. Uh, thanks for all the reviews. Spreading the suck. Every review helps every time. And you guys write the most wonderful things. And I read every single one of them. Uh, just fantastic. You guys just keep building that out. It really does spread the suck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and big thanks to official Time Suck Bojangles researcher uh, and, you know, and, and official intern, uh, Maddie the Heater Teeter, for structuring the colonization research and sucking Africa as well. Maddie and I double sucked the shit out of Africa this week. And I hope it was enjoyable for you. Uh, thanks to Maddie for coming up with that topic, by the way. It really grabbed my attention. I knew so little about the history of that continent. Next week on Time Suck, we go futuristic. Some sci-fi suck. It's been too long. Digital immortality. Is it possible to transfer human consciousness into the cloud? Into a hard drive? If so, what does that mean for our future? I find this stuff endlessly fascinating. This is going to be a really fun head scratcher of a suck. Uh, I'm going to suck and you're going to get blown. All right. Your mind is going to be blown as I do some sucking. Think about that. So I can't wait. Can't wait to suck on the, the possible post humanistic future of mankind. Now time for the present time for the, the recent past time for some time sucker updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. Today's first update comes in from the fuzz, from the popo, 5-0. Uh, came in with a subject line that made me nervous. Says, message from the police. I was like, oh, shit. And then I said, dear Dr. Reverend Colonel Esquire, I just want to thank you for your kind words you said towards police officers in your Jersey Devil episode. Not a shocker with the good things you say about the troops, uh, but still nice to hear. I'm a police officer in Oklahoma City and work in an area where I rarely hear anything but expletives towards me. Uh, your thank you was a much-needed morale boost in the middle of my shift and feel I should return a thank you slash morale boost. Keep sucking as hard as you do. You're killing it lately with the past few episodes. I listened to Andre Chikatilo for the first episode. Well, that was a big deal. And I was, uh, I was hooked, and they are just getting better. Oh, man, thank you. Uh, your episodes really help with uh, getting through some long shifts and hard nights. I actually had a prisoner about to piss herself laughing during the Idiots of the Internet segment on the Jersey Devil. If you ever find yourself in Oklahoma City, I'd be honored to have you as a ride-along for your shift. Oh, man, thank you. Uh, I'd also love to hear an episode on Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bombing. Well, thank you, Officer Jason. I'm going to leave your, your last name out uh, for privacy reasons. Love that you are, are, are letting or forcing prisoners to listen to the suck. That cracks me up. And I, and I love that at least one prisoner enjoyed it. I got to spread the suck, man, to the prison population. You know, they're eventually going to be able to get out and fucking have devices and listen. And I need all the uh, listeners I, I can get. Uh, so thanks for the love. Appreciate what you do big time. Uh, today's second update comes in from Time Sucker Stephen Hart, who writes in saying, 
Hey, Dan, I just found your podcast a couple weeks ago. It's amazing. The first one I listened to was Einstein, and now uh, I know I look like a damned maniac laughing by myself in the car on the way home. You completely suck, and it's awesome. I wanted to tell you that the damn... <laughs> <laughs> that the damn piney song you did in the last episode is writhing through my head like some kind of viral, insidious monstrosity, and it won't go away. So thanks for that. I swear, if I start singing it out loud. Also, if it hasn't been said before, Lucifina has got to be the baddest succubus ever. Thanks for the podcast. Keep on sucking. Proud to be a part of the cult of the curious. Take care, Stephen. Well, thank you, Stephen. And... I, I'm not quite sure. What song exactly were you talking about? I was trying to remember, like uh, from the from the Jersey Devil episode. Or were you talking about the song that went, Well, look at here now, I got some pig, cause his pig I ever did lick out of my woman's beard. Well, look at here now, with the full belly, I made a butt baby with the woman on mine, and the governor's wallet we got. Hee haw! Man, I, I hope I didn't just further embed that ear weasel back in your head. That would be cruel and unnecessary. That would be terrible. That would be like a, a piney McDonalding. Really just worse. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so, you know, so glad you enjoyed the show. And then an update on an old couple of episodes from recent convert, Time Sucker Chaz Charleston, who has an incredible email handle, Disciple of Nimrod 18. And Chaz writes, Good morrow, mother sucker. I've recently found your podcast thanks to your appearance on Heartland Radio and Jesus fucking Bojangles Balls. It's the first podcast that made me go back from the start and listen to the entire catalog from the beginning. It's an incredible saucy mix of informative and actual laugh-out-loud comedy. Oh, man, thank you, which is fucking phenomenal for my solitary night shift job. Unfortunately, since I just found uh, the, this hellacious wormhole, this is going to go way the fuck back a few episodes, specifically the Dark Web episode. I was on board until right near the end. That part, uh, the part that really got me was where you uh, equated police confiscating narcotics as theft. A notion I think is absolutely bananas and caused a lot of confusion because not long before, I listened to the Walmart episode where, unless I severely misunderstood, you advocated for taking someone's money uh, because they have a lot of it with the Waltons. I'm trying to wrap my head around why one would be considered theft and shouldn't be done and the other is acceptable. Uh, I, I should note my views on drug legality differ slightly from yours. I think anyway, remove marijuana from the equation because it's pretty universally agreed that it's not, it's not a concern anymore. Uh, I'm of the belief that if you decide to stash yourself in your house and do coke, heroin, meth, whatever, your drug of choice, uh, is all day and cause no problems for anyone else. That is your prerogative. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen often, if ever. The person who abuses drugs is inevitably going to need a whole slew of social services at some point to deal with the addiction and resulting medical issues. If when they start stealing things from uh, people to fuel their habit, the police justice system in involvement is going to require a considerable amount of time, energy, and resources to deal with it. While the act of possessing drugs to use may be a, a quote-unquote victimless crime, the drug use is inevitably going to be the direct cause of the addict using rather significant amounts of resources from state and local governments. Uh, therefore, I don't think it's unreasonable for state and local governments to apply rules prohibiting the possession, sale, use of those substances. Federal government involvement is a different beast. I'm a big fan of returning most governmental power to the states, but I digress. To tie this mess back together, I'm curious to learn your rationale behind why it's acceptable to take significant portions of the Waltons' money from them, but confiscating drugs from users is considered theft. Uh, if you're reading this without reading the rest, it's safe to assume there isn't going to be any response. So in that case, keep up the good work and thank you for what you do. Regards, your disciple uh, in the glory of Nimrod. Uh, yeah, so hail Nimrod. Well, all, all right, Chess. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, here's my answer. Uh, I was wrong. I think. I think looking back, uh, you got to be able to admit your mistakes. I, and I think I was wrong about the Waltz. Uh, I, I remember it's, it, it has been a while, but uh, my thing came from the kind of uh, feeling of the rich oppressor, poor oppressed, and kind of capitalism gone awry, and the upper one percent just just getting too much power and just economically kind of subjugating the bottom 99%, and that's why on an emotional level I advocated for taking their shit in this kind of rage against the machine kind of anger, you know, uh, sort of way. And I do think I let my emotions, you know, get get the best of me uh, because, yes, on a non-emotional, uh, ethical place, it, it is not okay to just take what someone else has made because you feel they took too much or have made too much, I guess, rather. Uh, that's a very slippery slope that's just going to lead to a bad place. And regarding the seizure of certain drugs being equated to theft, that one is tricky. Uh, again, I think we're agreed on marijuana that that, you know, is kind of silly to uh, to, to take that. It's not really a, a big problem maker. Uh, and it's becoming legal in most states. But, you know, hard drugs, you know, I, like with opiates, I, I, I do think actually – you are right when, when I really think about it in a complex way. And again, I was coming from this place of I think I was using marijuana as the main example 
and then expanding that to kind of narcotics in this kind of libertarian way of like, you know, we should be able to do what we're doing as long as we're not harming someone else. And then why are we, you know, put in prisons and then the, and then the prisons? I remember that the argument from that being some some studies I'd cited about how much money goes into private prisons and that becomes a business and people are just being exploited in that way. And you know, if they haven't harmed anybody violently, you know, what's the big deal? But you bring up a good point. Where, you know, when it, when it comes to like opiates and things like that, which are a real problem where I live in Coeur d'Alene, uh, opiate addiction and other things, it, it doesn't tend to be a, a I'm not bothering anyone situation. It does tend to be a downward spiral and at the very least social services get involved in helping the person get back on their feet, which does take away from the taxpayer base so it's not victimless. So – uh, yeah, I, I, you know, if I, if I could go back now, uh, as I've evolved over the last few months, I would make different arguments. So thank you for making me think, Chaz. I love the two way street of the suck, man. You know, one should never be above rethinking their belief system. When you, when you get into a place where you're like, nope, I'm for sure right. And you're not going to fucking change my mind. Well, you know, and, and you don't even hear the other person out. Well, that's, that's, that's a bad spot to be. That's a bad spot to be in, you know, cause none of us have all the answers. And, and, I, and I love this community we're building and, you know, and helping give each other a better understanding. And if I'm going to challenge you guys, I would be one hell of a fucking hypocrite to not allow myself to be challenged and not allow myself to realize that, yeah, fuck up a little here and there with my arguments. So, so thank you. Thank you. And, uh, I, I appreciate the knowledge. Thanks to you. And thanks to all you time suckers. Thanks time suckers. I needed that. We all did. So that is it. Uh, that is it today. Time suckers and future space lizards here are going to be space lizards real soon. Uh, have a great week. Uh, definitely don't don't go colonizing any foreign nations. You know, subjugating any continents. Uh, definitely do sign up now to become a space lizard. You know, don't miss out. Hail Nimrod and keep on sucking. <laughs>